Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 41 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Ginger Savely, and the topic of the show is Morgellons. Dr. Savely graduated in 1972 from the University of Maryland with bachelor's degrees in psychology and music. In 1978, she earned a master's degree in educational philosophy from Lesley College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 1985, she enrolled in the nursing program at the University of Texas at Austin, and in 1988 completed her bachelor's of nursing degree. Dr. Savely worked as an RN for the next 10 years in pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, urgent care, and family practice. She received her master's degree in nursing and a certification as a family nurse practitioner in 1998. During this time, she became interested in and progressively more knowledgeable about Lyme disease. By 2003, 80% of her practice was devoted to Lyme patients. At about the same time, she became aware of a strange new disease called Morgellons disease. When word got out through a local news story that she was helping these patients, people with the symptoms of Morgellons disease started coming to her by the dozens. In 2004, she was honored with the title of Texas Nurse Practitioner of the Year for her work with Lyme and Morgellons disease. Dr. Savely began to publish articles, do presentations at conferences, and appear in the media about her work with Lyme and Morgellons disease. She was accepted into the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society and sat on the advisory boards of the Texas Lyme Disease Association and the Morgellons Research Foundation. Doctors in Austin had a very narrow view of Lyme disease and were convinced that it did not exist in Texas and thought that even if it were contracted elsewhere, a simple week of antibiotics would totally cure it. Many of them resented the fact that a nurse practitioner had the nerve to use diagnosis and treatment methods that went against the prevailing medical paradigm. From 2003 to 2006, at the instigation of the Texas Board of Medical Examiners, Dr. Savely endured a drawn-out investigation by her regulatory board, the Texas Board of Nurse Examiners. The board investigation finally ended with no more than a trivial finding and what amounted to a slap on the wrist. In 2005, having seen the writing on the wall and realizing that her days of practicing in Texas might soon be over, Dr. Savely had opened an auxiliary office in San Francisco. Although many doctors in Austin believed in what Dr. Savely was doing and even referred patients to her, none would agree to collaborate with her for fear of raising a red flag with the medical boards. Because Dr. Savely could find no other physician in Austin willing to assume the risk of practicing with her, she moved her practice full-time to San Francisco in 2006. In 2009, she earned a doctorate degree in nursing practice from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, where she was honored with the Dean's Legacy Award. In March 2011, she moved her practice from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., In 2016, she published her book, Morgellons, The Legitimization of a Disease, a factual guide by the world's leading clinical expert, which is available on Amazon.com. And now my interview with Dr. Ginger Savely. So I've observed the world of chronic illness now for about 20 years and seen the kind of landscape of Lyme disease from the time I got diagnosed about 12 years ago. And at that time, very few people believed that Lyme disease was a real condition. And so today, it seems to me that Morgellons is in a similar place, being a very real condition that's often considered psychosomatic and not really physical in origin. So I personally have had the opportunity to meet some people with Morgellons over the years. It's very clear to me that their struggle is real. And I'm honored to have you on the show today as an expert in this topic to share your experience and to hopefully help enlighten people about this important conversation. Thanks for being Thanks, here. Scott. Thanks, yeah. Scott. I, I, I'm honored to be here and, and happy to be here so that I can help uh, dispel maybe some of the myths that are going on around about this illness. 
fantastic. I'm happy to have you. So let's start by talking about how you got interested in Lyme disease and in Morgellons. Did you have some personal experience? Did you have family experience with either of these conditions? Like many of us who treat Lyme disease, I did have a lot of personal experience with it. I was first extremely ill with it myself about 25 years ago and in bed for a few years and, and uh, went through all the same things that most people do trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And then, unfortunately, both of my daughters became very, very ill. And one of my daughters basically had to drop out of high school when she was 16 um, because she was so sick. And at that time, I decided I needed to learn everything I could about treating it because although her doctor was sympathetic, he really just didn't know we were in Austin, Texas, and not too much Lyme disease was was recognized, at least uh, there. So that's when how I became interested in learning much more about it, of course. And then it started popping up all over my family, unfortunately, as it so often will in certain families. Um, and... And so I've had more personal experience uh, with it than I cared to admit. But uh, the thing with the uh, Morgellons is that I was treating Lyme disease in Austin, Texas in the early 2000s. And I became aware of the fact that several of my patients had lesions on their skin. And they told me about filaments or fibers that were coming out of these lesions that were very unusual and sometimes quite long, sometimes colored. And I had never heard this before, this complaint from any of my other patients. At the time, I was doing family practice, so I saw quite a few other patients that did not have tick disease. And I uh, conferred with my my colleague in, in Houston, Texas, um, and he was seeing the same thing with his Lyme p- patients. Now, this was Dr. Bill Harvey, unfortunately, who has since deceased. But uh, we were talking about this a lot at the time. We were just absolutely baffled by it. And then he told me that he had discovered the work of Mary Leto in Pennsylvania, uh, a a biologist, microbiologist, who had a small child with the disease. She is the person who, I would say, rebirthed the term Morgellons, because it had actually been around quite a long time, even since the 1600s, but had not been thought about or talked about or written about for many, many years. She looked back in the old, old history books and the old medical books, found the term, thought it sounded similar to what was going on with her little child, and kind of rebirthed this term to describe what was going on with the patients that we were seeing. So we've all, we both kind of pronounced it already more Jellens, but I remember introducing you at Mm -hmm. one of the conferences and that was the first thing I wanted to make sure I got right because more often (laughs) than not, I hear people pronounce it more Jellens, but it is actually more Jellens, correct? I'm not sure why some people say more Jellens. It sort of uh, surprises me because after all, the explorer Magellan, (laughs) very similar name. We always say Mm -hmm. Magellan, not Magellan. And in English, G-E-L is pronounced gel. Um, I immediately pronounced it more Jellens. And also, I know that it came first from uh, French, uh, which would be Morgellon. So again, the soft G. So um, most of us who are involved with working with the disease are pronouncing it Morgellons. (laughs) So what are some of the common symptoms of Morgellons? What do people experience when they have the condition? What do they feel? It can vary dramatically from the most mild cases to the most severe. But one thing that they all share in common is a feeling of a biting, crawling, stinging sensations in an, on top of their skin, underneath their skin. Uh, this is a miserable feeling. There's itching included. It feels like they're being bitten. It feels like something's crawling underneath their skin. And then to top it off, of course, they have these unusual things coming out of their skin, filaments and um, little specks of black stuff. And I mean, any number of things that you should not be seeing coming out of your skin. And of course, that's very upsetting to people because they just have never seen or heard anything like this. And of course, when they tell their friends and family and they tell their doctors, even they look at them like they're crazy because they say, you know, that doesn't happen. You know, you can't have blue fibers coming out of your skin. 
So naturally, they're not treated very, very well. So I've heard people talk about the crawling sensations. Do we know, is it actually some type of organism or something moving throughout the body? Is it a neurological manifestation that makes it feel like there's crawling or biting? Do we know what actually causes that? There's kind of two things going on. First of all, the filaments that I speak of, those are the diagnostic feature for this disease. Uh, if you don't have the fibers or filaments, you don't have Morgellons disease. That's, that's what defines it. These filaments have been found to made up, be made from the body's own proteins, keratin and collagen. So we're making these filaments ourselves. These filaments, as they move under the skin, can cause sensations of stinging, biting, crawling. I mean, it feels as though there's something alive under there moving, but it is actually the growth of the filaments under the skin that's causing the sensation. Now, I also believe that these patients do have paresthesias, and paresthesias are common to Lyme patients as well. And this is when the nerve endings get a little bit irritated, inflamed, and people can have sensations of, uh, well, I remember having this when I had Lyme disease where I would constantly feel like I, something was biting me and I'd look down and there was nothing there, or I'd feel like something was crawling on my arm and nothing was there. So those paresthesias are common to uh, all the tick-borne disease patients as well as Morgellons patients. So I think you know, for the Morgellons patients, the sensations they're having is probably a combination of those two, the paresthesias, the, the nerve, uh, nerve excitability, and then actually the fibers as they move their way through the skin. So how do you diagnose someone with Morgellons? Do you actually look at their skin under a microscope of some kind? What do you see? What does their skin look like when they have the presentation of Morgellons? Well, right now the uh, diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis, uh, meaning there are no lab tests uh, that can tell a person whether they have this or not. This is um, very unfortunate to my patients because they want to have the definitive you know, diagnosis. But many times there are diagnoses that are based on um, clinical criteria. And in the case of Morgellons, we base it on whether the patient has the classic symptoms and whether they have filaments protruding from their skin as visualized by a practitioner in the office. Uh, so what I do is I take a lighted magnifier of, it really only needs to be about approximately 60X, anywhere from 30 to 200, but I find 60 to 100 in there to be the ideal for looking at the skin. And then I just have to very patiently look at various places on the skin. Some people think, oh, you only need to look at the lesions, but that's not really true. Sometimes these filaments are coming out of intact skin as well. And so it just takes time and patience. I know that many doctors don't have the luxury of that time when they're seeing a patient in the office, and that's one reason they probably can't really investigate this as well as, as they should. Also, the standard dermatologist will, will carry a dermatoscope in his pocket that's about a 12X, and that's just not quite strong enough to see what we need to see. And so some of the standard dermatologists will, even if they do give the patient the courtesy of examining them, which they often don't, they will often say, well, this is crazy, and they just kick them out of the office. But if they do examine them. Sometimes it's not strong enough for them to really see anything. And plus, they don't take the time to look, 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 which it often involves. So let's talk about that a little bit, the idea of delusional parasitosis. And I know that right. many people that have Morgellons have been told that their condition is psychosomatic or delusional, that it's imagined, that it's all in their head. So having seen this for so many years now and worked with so many people, I know you've worked with over a thousand people with Morgellons. Um, what are your thoughts when people are invalidated by others and they're really truly suffering? And why is this not delusional parasitosis? Right. I'm not 100% sure there really is a thing called delusional parasitosis because through the years, who knows, all these poor souls that have been lumped into that diagnosis may very well have been having something 
like Morgellons disease. But the idea behind delusional parasitosis is that there is nothing wrong with you, you know, and that you're that you're imagining it all. That's very clearly not the case with these patients because anyone who spends any time with them and examines them and also listens to the many other symptoms they have will clearly see that these people are not delusional. Beside the skin sensations, there are many other symptoms these patients have that will remind you a lot of tick-borne disease symptoms. The patients have um, achy joints, achy muscles, headaches, kind of brain fog, you know, not able to think clearly, they can't sleep at night. There's many, many symptoms, and they're all the same symptoms that we hear about for Lyme disease and co-infections. So these are clearly ill people. They're not, um, you know, the, these people are, are, are sick. And some of my worst cases, you know, they, they can't get out of bed. Now, I guess, you know, I still talk to some dermatologists who are non-believers who still say, I don't care about all those things. All of those things are also uh, psychosomatic. Um, I guess, in a way, you have to just trust your gut when you're working with patients um, and and know when somebody (laughs) really has something and really doesn't. Now, I do occasionally have people come to me to be evaluated for Morgellons disease. And in a very rare cases, I've only seen a few, um, there actually was uh, something else going on and I'm not sure what. But as long as the filaments are coming out, my goodness, the filaments can be seen. They can be seen, you know, and these are very unusual. And if they are happening, we know this person has it. Now, I know a lot of people will say, a lot of dermatologists have told me, oh, these patients are sticking those filaments into their skin. Now, I can just tell you right now, that's just physically impossible because I've tried to remove these filaments and they're very difficult to remove. So there is just no way uh, these could be inserted into the skin by the patient. Uh, I mean, what can I say? (laughs) You just have to trust me on that. (laughs) And and I look back, you know, before I got my Lyme diagnosis, how many people had told me that my whole condition was psychosomatic and every single person that would refer you to a psychiatrist Mm. and, and clearly that wasn't the case. And so, you know, now I think in that kind of realm, Lyme is more accepted now, fortunately, maybe not as much as it should be, but I think there is more understanding and acceptance as compared to 10 or 12 years ago, um, more Mm. gelins and pandas Um, are conditions that still seem to be kind of not very well accepted. And I've done a show on pandas, and that's a very interesting conversation as well. But the Morgellons um, arena, it it seems like Lyme, you know, a decade or two ago, um, in terms of its understanding and acceptance. I know that you, um, around the conversation of being psychosomatic and delusional, I know that you've had some observations around um, whole families experiencing it, children experiencing it. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that's not something that would necessarily support it being a psychosomatic condition? Exactly. Um, there are many uh, reasons why it's hard to believe or it's hard to think of this as a psychosomatic condition. First of all, I have seen very small children with the uh, with the illness. And so, you know, you don't really see two-year-olds who are are psychotic or delusional. Um, We also, of course, have animals, dogs, cats, and horses have the condition. Again, I don't know too much about this, but I don't think we see a lot of delusional horses and cats and dogs. Um, So there are many things that make me very skeptical about the fact that this is a delusion. Now, sometimes entire families have this. And when entire families have it, that's when they tend to say to me, you know, this has to be person to person contagious or why would we all have it? But I truly believe from everything that I've seen and learned so far that this is not contagious person to person. In the case of a family having it, there was a common exposure source. Sometimes it's very clear. I have had numerous families where this all started with a flea infestation. And after the family got numerous flea bites, next thing you know, they all went on to start having the symptoms of Morgellons disease. Uh, But 
you know, I do not think I have way too many patients who have very severe cases of Morgellons who continue to take care of their children, sleep, sleep with their spouses, you know, behave normally with their friends and family, and they are not giving it to those people. So this this is a tricky one and one that often is people are always wanting to tell me this is very contagious person to person. I don't believe that. I feel that if anyone would have gotten it that way, it would be me by now because I have examined so many and I do not take any special precautions when I do examine patients. Frankly, anytime I do, it's for their own protection. Like if they have an open lesion, I'll put on gloves so I won't you know, infect their lesion, but I have no fear of catching it from them. And then is there also some seasonal aspect of when you see people presenting with the condition? I think you've talked about that in the past too. Is it more common in certain seasons for some reason or? I, um, I notice uh, through the years, I, I, have, I, I haven't been able to notice any difference as far as when people present to me because sometimes, shoot, they've had it for so long. By the time they get to me, it just they want to get there as soon as they can. But what people report to me is their symptoms are often way worse in, in the hot weather. And I've had people tell me, I've had this for 20 years and it kind of goes dormant all winter and then it, then it really revs up during the summer, during the hot months. And I've had many patients say that that's when their symptoms are worse, when they're hot, when they're sweaty, you know, these kinds of things. And I think there are many uh, skin conditions that are worse in those, in that type of environment. Uh, So I really don't know what to think of that or whether it's significant or not okay. in the long run. So let's talk about the connection between Morgellons and Lyme. Uh, what percentage yeah. of people with Morgellons also have Lyme disease? Can it occur without Lyme disease? Or maybe is it just that their Lyme disease hasn't really been proven yet? And then is Morgellons a manifestation of Lyme or possibly a co-infection of Lyme? What's the connection between those two conditions? Well, You've asked the million dollar question there. <laughs> and this is the one that, that everybody's wondering about now and trying to figure out. A couple of studies have shown that 6% of Lyme patients get Morgellons disease. Um, we don't know why, only a certain small amount. There could be genetic predisposition. There's still a lot, much that we need to learn. There's only one study, mine, that uh, talks about how many Morgellons patients have Lyme. In other words, first I said, how many Lyme patients get Morgellons, and that's 6%. But how many Morgellons patients have Lyme? My study showed 97%. The few that did not have any suggestion of Lyme, they did not have any symptomatic symptoms, they did not have... um, they didn't have the positive serology. They they didn't react to antibiotics like a Lyme patient. They really did not seem like they were Lyme patients. Those few percentage, they actually had other severe immune suppression going on. Uh, two cases were on high dose prednisone due to an autoimmune condition, and one case was uh, an AIDS patient, and one case was case was um, on the immune suppression due to organ transplant. So one thing that's for sure, people who get Morgellons disease do have immune suppression for one reason or another. But it is fascinating, this connection with Lyme disease. We don't know absolutely for sure yet whether the Lyme is directly related. In other words, is this a dermatologic manifestation of Lyme or whether somehow just having the Lyme disease predisposes people to having the Morgellons. We can't say that for sure yet, even though we have found in almost all lesions of Morgellons patients, the spirochete that causes Lyme disease has been found. Now, of course, presence does not prove causation. So we don't know for sure that because those Lyme spirochetes are there in the lesions, are they causing Morgellons? Or are they there because the patient also happened to have Lyme disease? You know, right. um, there's still a lot of questions, but there's no doubt that we have seen so much association between these conditions 
that we have gone down a path of looking at that very strongly, but wondering why only certain Lyme patients do tend to go in that direction of getting Morgellons disease. You mentioned Borrelia spirochetes being identified in the uh, area of lesions in some with Morgellons. Are there other common infections or microbes that are seen either around the lesions or just at higher incidence systemically in people that have Morgellons? The thing that is so fascinating is that what we're mostly finding in these lesions are spirochetes of various kinds. Now, one spirochete is the, the Borrelia spirochete that causes Lyme disease. But we're finding other spirochetes in the lesions, trypanemas, and trypanema pallidum is the one that causes syphilis, but there are other trypanemas as well. Um, there's trypanema denticola, which causes actually you know, problems in the mouth, but those spirochetes have been found in the Morgellons lesions, oddly enough. We're also finding something that's not technically a spirochete, but is often lumped together with spirochetes, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, which can cause ulcers, stomach ulcers. We're finding that in the, the lesions as well. And again, a little bit of a mystery why this would be turning up, although H. pylori is showing up in a lot of different conditions now. We're finding it in various autoimmune conditions. So there's a lot we still need to learn about that. But I think the most fascinating thing right now is trying to understand this association of spirochetes with Morgellons disease, because th those tend to be the organisms that we're finding in these people. And when we say they show up around the lesions, do we know, do they show up in similar percentages in people with Lyme if we just do some kind of testing of the skin, but they don't have lesions? I'm assuming it's higher in Morgellons, but has that done been done? That's, that's a really good question. And actually, yes, yeah, some of the studies that have been done have been using, um, we have, uh, let me see, they have used uh, controls, in other words, but these are people that don't have Lyme disease at all. Mm -hmm. So I know there's a lot more research that needs to be done, and you're bringing up good points because here's the thing, Scott, is that research takes money and a lot of money, and we have not been able to get funding for the research for this. Every bit of the research we've done so far has been thanks to the goodwill of certain researchers who have just become fascinated in this and have donated their own valuable time. We've also had some personal donations that have helped uh, quite a bit too. So many questions are still there and so many things we need to find out. And if only we could have a source where we could get some funding to, to figure this thing out. I feel like we're always caught in a catch-22. We can't really get funding until we prove it's a disease. And we can't prove it's a disease until we get funding. So... Um, so if yeah. someone's listening that maybe has connections to people that can help with the funding, is the Charles E. Holman Foundation, is that the best place for them to reach out? Who would they yes, connect with? Yes, yes. The Charles E. Holman Foundation uh, for Morgellons Education and Research. And uh, so far, they're the ones that have been supporting any of the research that has been going on, and of course, all the education as well, and they have an annual conference. Now, we've already had 10 of those annual conferences, and they're, we're trying to educate uh, healthcare providers in those conferences, just raise awareness too, so there won't be so much discrimination against these people. So I think there's a lot of myths out there about Morgellons, different things people have heard about, you know, chemtrails or GMOs and, you know, things mm -hmm. of that nature. So I'm sure you've heard them all. And I just wondered if there are some of these myths that you would like to dispel. Sure, there are many of them. Um, first of all, I want to point out that a lot of the different things that people are worried about is in terms of causing Morgellons, I think can be factors in terms of they can be things that are suppressing a person's immune system. And the more suppressed a person's immune system is, the more likely they are 
to succumb to, well, any infection <laughs> and this being one of them. So, um, for example, uh, GMOs, uh, chemtrails, that kind of thing. Certainly, these are not, these are things that are not healthy for the immune system, for, for people to be exposed to chemicals of any kind. And it creates an inflammatory response in the body. And when the body is in this inflammatory state like that, it's not as able to combat various infections that may come its way. So in that sense, they're related, but they do not cause this because this is clearly from what we're seeing so far uh, an infection now people are more prone to infections when they have been exposed to chemicals because their immune system isn't working as well so in that sense i guess you could say there's some relationship yes but they're not the cause what what's causing this is some sort of a bacterial infection that's causing the body to do things that it doesn't normally do. In other words, produce these filaments or fibers of keratin and collagen in amounts and in places where we normally do not find them. Now, why is this? Why is this proliferation happening? And again, we have more questions than answers, but at least going down that line of thinking, it makes more sense because I think most of my colleagues just say, well, this is ridiculous. It's irrational. I mean, why, why would the human body do that? Well, you know, <laughs> the, the human body can do all sorts of strange things when it's, um, when it's compelled to through not a combination of infection and some sort of genetic uh, predispositions. And those are the things we still need to investigate so much, the genetic um, predispositions as well. I know there have been some articles about connections between Morgellons and dental materials to different plant bacteria, people that have mm -hmm. talked about it being maybe some kind of mite that affects the skin in some way. Right. Are, are any of those still things that are being explored or have any potential connection here at all or no? No. Again, the dental material, I feel the same way as I do with the GMO and the, and the chemtrail and all that. Sure, there could be the possibility that anything that is in the body that doesn't belong in the body, anything artificial could be suppressing uh, immunity. That, that's for sure. Um, when it comes to mites, no, we ha many people are quite convinced that these are tiny little mites in the skin. The researchers have not been able to, to find that at all. Uh, the other thing that is very often thought of is um, that these are tiny, tiny little flies laying eggs under the skin. And a lot of people are very convinced that something like this is going on. However, as many samples as have been taken, research have not been able to find anything like this. And so far, all we can do is, is go with what we've been able to see in the laboratory. A lot of people come up with theories, and people all the time are contacting me and saying, I think that um, uh, I, I, you know, I have a theory and I know why, I know why this is happening, but I mean, people can come up with theories, but they have to be backed up by the research in the laboratory. And so, so far we're, we're really having to go by what we're seeing so far in, in our research. Um, in, in the book that I wrote, I, I do have a whole chapter, uh, on, uh, dispelling the myths and explaining in detail why each of these various theories have, that have been proposed are not really accurate and should not be taken seriously. Perfect. And uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention the book here. On yeah, this we're going to definitely mention oh, it. Oh, yeah, okay. You can mention, but you can mention say, it now too, sure. It may, it may make it easier yeah. to, uh, as a matter of fact, a little self-promo here, <laughs> sure. um, to, to go through the book. I've written it in a very easy to understand way for the layperson. And, and in fact, I've even written it with large, large print and big spacing because a lot of patients have told me that that helps them a lot because I know a lot of my Morgellons patients do have trouble right now reading 
reading things. So, right. And uh, so I think that will bring you up to date on exactly what we know right now. There's still so much we don't know, but, you know, at least it helps you understand a little bit better that there is some scientific basis behind this because I'm afraid that a lot of times what's out there on the internet when somebody first starts to do their research, they, they're, they're seeing rather preposterous ideas that are really cannot be validated at all. And, and, and then they get more afraid and then they just don't even want to research any further because it's just too creepy, the things that they're reading about. And I am fortunate to have a signed copy of that book that you just showed. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. That was great. Yeah. So let's talk about other um, potential exposure. So I've heard people talk about some kind of skin barrier break, maybe with gardening or splinters or thorns or cuts. Mm-hmm. Is, is that connection still something that you more commonly see in people that present with more gelins? Let's put it this way. I feel very strongly that in order to come down with this disease, let's put it like that, there has to be um, a break somehow in this, it has to get into the blood, the circulatory system. In other words, if I'm, you have more gelins and I'm sitting next to you on the bus, I'm not going to get it from you. You know, I always tell people, think of it more like AIDS. In other words, you know, you're not, you're not going to, uh, chances would be extremely rare that you could get AIDS from drinking out of the same glass with somebody. You'd have to be be a very convoluted situation for that to happen. And, and it's pretty much the same here. So in other words, a bite, like from a biting insect, a splinter, a thorn, uh, you know, these are the these are the stories that I hear over and over again. Now, not everybody is sure, but I have quite a few people say it all started after I was gardening and I got stuck by a, a rose thorn or I got bit by this or I got a splinter. And so in other words, something has been injected into the skin. And uh, whether that, you know, there's a bacteria that goes in that way, um, you know, that's, that's part of this that's still very fascinating to think about, you know, exactly what it is. Now, um, I know that some people are jumping the gun a little bit and actually calling Morgellons a dermatologic manifestation of Lyme disease. I think we're really too soon to say that. Um, we know there's an association there. But we do not know that this is a dermatologic manifestation of Lyme disease yet. Um, you know, it would be like with uh, Kaposi's sarcoma sarcoma uh, and AIDS. I always think of that, you know, that, that sarcoma happens a lot with AIDS patients, but it's not a dermatologic manifestation of AIDS. It's just AIDS patients are more susceptible to that. So I don't know. Is that what we have here? We, we don't know for sure. But I just um, feel like we need to be very careful in our terminology and continue to realize there is a strong association uh, with the Lyme bacteria, but we still don't know exactly you know, what that is. So coming back to Lyme then, if someone has Lyme and they're also dealing with Morgellons, which sounds like it's a significant percentage based on your research, how important is it that they treat the underlying Lyme disease? And in some cases, is treating the Lyme enough to resolve the Morgellons or do they need to treat both of them differently? I found that with most of the cases that I've treated, if I treat the underlying infections and the Lyme disease being one of them, and also many times there are other tick-borne co-infections such as primarily Bartonella, but also Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Babesia, and various other, uh, for the majority of people, this helps significantly. I would say right now, of the ones I've treated, about 10% become completely asymptomatic, and they're well. They're, they go on their merry way, you know. And then about 10% get no response to treatment, and unfortunately, or very little response to treatment. And then more like 80% get better but they don't get 100% better, but they get significantly better to the point where they can function and not be extremely bothered by their symptoms. They're, the symptoms are there. They are an annoyance, 
but they're able to, to live with them. Now, for that 10% that don't respond, I always find there's something else going on. And these are the people where I look real carefully for mold exposure in their environment. Very often, that's part of the picture. There's some very uh, deep psychological problem going on. Perhaps they're living in an abusive uh, home environment. There's something there. I mean, there's something else that's really, really suppressing the immune system. And so then it just becomes a matter of really becoming a detective and, and trying to find out, you know, what's going on and why those people don't get better. But it always surprises me how different everyone reacts to treatment. Some people react, um, some people really respond very well and get significantly better. For others, it's a long haul. And of course, Scott, you know, it just sounds just like it is with the Lyme patients, right? I mean, it's very similar. Uh, you know, just for some folks, it's just, it's just a tough, tough road. And we have to look at everything that's burdening the immune system. So let's talk a little bit more about what people call the fibers, but more correctly, you refer to them as filaments. I believe filaments is the more accurate term based on what I understand. Um, you've talked about the idea that you can see them under magnification. You've talked about the fact that they're made of collagen and keratin. So is it that the body then, for whatever reason, maybe it's response to a microbe, the body is really then creating these filaments versus them being um, more of a microbe themselves is what it sounds like. And then where are some of the places in the body? I mean, can these pretty much come out in any place in the body? Are there specific areas where they're more common? Yeah. Um, now, see, here's, here's what happens. The, the, um, the, the cells that, that normally produce, let's say, keratin, keratinocytes, these are we've known for many years, uh, several decades anyway, that these are sites in the body where the Lyme spirochete really likes to hang out. <laughs> it's kind of a safe place for them. So they do what they we do find Lyme spir spirochetes there. Why are the Lyme spirochetes hiding out in the keratinocytes able to make those cells? do something in an abnormal quantity. It's hyperproliferation of those cells that's creating all of this excess keratin. And why is that happening? And why is it only happening in some people? Um, that appears to be what's going on, though. The infection somehow is driving these cells to hyperproliferate. Now, because of that, when we think of where we mostly have cells that produce keratin and collagen, well, we think of our head, right? Because our, our hair uh, is, is made of these uh, primarily keratin. And so I have quite a few patients that have uh, probably their hugest site of discomfort is their head and where their hair is. However, I've seen the lesions and I've seen the filaments in every part of the body. Uh, really can't think of any, I mean, it's been in people's eyeballs, you know, it comes out in people's urine. Uh, it comes out in, they come out in men's um, semen and, 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 and vaginal secretions. I mean, I've had patients who are, where microbiologists look at their own blood and, and see the filaments in their blood under the microscope. And so they're, they're everywhere. And of course, creating more damage in some people than in others. Um, Scott, you, you actually had asked me several questions back to back, and now I've kind of forgotten what some of them were. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think, but, I think you covered them. It was really just, um, are they the result of the body's hyper creation of these filaments versus are they themselves potentially some type of microbial um, no, I, the, the filaments, what we've always seen is the filaments themselves are not infective agents. And so in other words, a lot of patients are afraid, oh, the filaments are going to get on my friend and then my friend's going to catch more gelons because of that. No, the filaments, just think of them as byproducts, you know, and they can be skin irritants because very much like if you're in a room where there's been... Um, you know, fiberglass or something, you know, you, you'll have these little irritants in the air and you notice that in your mucous membranes. 
And I do sometimes after a patient will leave my office, a patient with Morgellons, I will notice for about 15 minutes, I'll feel kind of my eyes and nose a little itchy. And then that settles down as the filaments settle down. But they're not infective agents. So I don't want patients to worry that if they're in a public space and they are, they do have fibers coming out of their skin, that they're going to infect other people. These, these are, I guess I've just always called them byproducts. You know, they're, they're mm-hmm. not infective agents themselves. Perfect. I've heard some people talk about kind of a slimy or oily layer on the skin that's also common in people with more gelin. So do we know what that slime layer is made Again, of? Again, mostly guesses on our part. Um, alginate is, is part of what uh, many bacteria form biofilms uh, for protection. And this is how they sort of glue themselves into a clump. So the safety in numbers kind of thing. And the, um, the glue that they use uh, is mostly alginate, which is kind of a sugar. And we have found this alginate in the biopsies of, of the Morgellons patients and can only guess that the slimy feeling that they sometimes report, sometimes they say waxy, sometimes they say slimy, but it's where it's, it's a sensation on their skin that's not normal. Uh, may be related to that alginate, the biofilm material. This is pretty much a guess, you know, at this stage of the game. But it's clearly one of the symptoms that needs to be taken very seriously. And uh, I've had patients that take showers three or four times a day because of this sensation on their skin and they just can't, you know, they don't feel clean because of it. Let's talk a little bit now about treatment. So what kinds of things do you find are most helpful for people with Morgellons? Are the things that are more helpful generally systemic treatments? Are they topical skin localized type therapies? What are some of the things that help people with Morgellons? Right. You always ask such good questions, Scott. <laughs> You've been doing this a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Well, actually, you know, I find the topicals are all minimally helpful. And this is the the little sort of the joke we have in the Morgellons world is that any topical will work for two weeks. I mean, anything. I, you know, petroleum jelly, I, I don't care what it is, it helps for two weeks and then stops. And so really, a lot of times I'll, I'll have uh, colleagues contact me or patients and say, yay, I've found the cure, you know, and I'd be like, well, how long have you been using it? And they'll be like, a week. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, well, let's just wait a little bit and see what happens. Because they usually don't last, it doesn't last. But so what I do need to do is give um, antibiotics and in a greater quantity than I would like to, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And the way these people tend to get well is if they can, uh, you know, really take a fairly aggressive antibiotic protocol. And the protocol will include other things uh, beside anti infectives. It will also be things like anti-protozoas, anti-helminthics, anti-fungals, that kind of thing. Since the beginning, we've been really much just experimenting with these patients because we didn't know what we were dealing with. And so it was just, hey, let's try this, let's try that, you know. And through the years, I've started to notice certain things help more than others. But Scott, the thing that really is just unbelievable about this is how a certain treatment will help one person like a miracle, and then it won't help the next person at all. And that has made this so much more difficult because you would think as many patients I've treated now in in 14 years of doing this, I would have the formula down pat by now. But unfortunately, each case is unique and doesn't always work. But I would say, and what I always tell other practitioners, is the thing that has worked the best for these patients is treating them with an antibiotic protocol that would be usually used for the Bartonella infection. And Bartonella in its acute form is known as cat scratch fever. And sometimes primary care doctors will see this in their office, you know, when somebody had a cat scratch and then they get a big swollen gland and fever. And that's caused by the Bartonella bacteria. Now, those of us who treat tick-borne diseases 
also treat a chronic form of Bartonella, and we will often treat this with a quin alone, uh, which is something like Cipro or Levaquin, if the patient can tolerate that, or we will treat it with a combination of rifampin and doxycycline, or we'll treat it with a combination of a sulfa drug, um, such as Septra or Bactrim, as they're known in, in the, uh, the name brand world, uh, along with something like um, uh, Biaxin or Zithromax. And so I always have the best luck when my treatment focuses on the Bartonella co-infection. And it gets more complicated. It's very much like treating anyone with Lyme and tick-borne diseases. There's lots of experimentation, add this, subtract this, double this, you know. But I'd say a good starting point for anyone who is interested in helping people with this is to get them started on a Bartonella protocol. I usually say, look, start right off with clarithromycin and um, generic Bactrim DS. That combo right there, probably if I had to pick one combo, that's helped the most people, that would be it. And now some people are helped with antifungals, uh, but very few. Uh, some of my patients, uh, I get emails all the time from people who say, I've found the cure, you know, and a lot of people will tell me, oh, it's all about antifungals. And I'm, I've tried antifungals on, on many, many people and very rarely they help. Uh, most of the time they don't. But hey, you know, it's always good with these patients just to kind of <clears throat> try it, excuse me, try everything uh, because we just don't know what's going to work. So we try antifungals. We even throw in antivirals and we do try the antihelminthics to see if they have any um, help at all. Now, antihelminthics means dewormers, you know, it's kind of the common name for antihelminthics. And these are things like um, ivermectin, Biltricide, albendazole, mentazole, uh, thiabendazole, those, those kind of medications. And they're commonly used for worms. So I'm always very careful to tell patients, look, we're going to try this. It does not mean I think you have worms. Uh, there's absolutely no way Morgellons is caused by worms, even though people want to think that because the filaments can sometimes look like worms. But Many times we find that a medication will work for a purpose other than which, for which it was originally intended. And this happens all the time in, in medicine, you know. So we've seen that some of these antihelminthics can help some patients. So it's always a good idea to add those in. Who knows? They might not help that one particular patient. They have helped others. And of the ones that I've used, I would say the one that statistically has helped the most has been ivermectin. Um, and uh, But again, it's always worth uh, trying a little bit of everything with these people. It's interesting, the ivermectin, because I've heard people suggest that ivermectin also may help people dealing with Bartonella. And so again, it seems, mm -hmm. like, seems like it kind of comes back to that uh, Bartonella. I I've heard others suggest that maybe Bartonella could be the organism that then is causing the production of these filaments. Do we think there is potentially a connection between Morgellons and some Bartonella-like organism? Do we see Morgellons in people that don't have any Bartonella-type uh, symptoms? Well, here's the thing. You, you know how hard this is, Scott, with diagnosing these things. Um, I have a reached a point just clinically because I, I don't, I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician. And I am constantly telling the researchers, look, there's some connection here with Bartonella. I just know that because my patients also have many other symptoms typical of Bartonella and because they respond to Bartonella treatment. So far, Dr. Randy Wymore at the Oklahoma University uh, State University Research Center for Morgellons has found uh, Bartonella organisms in the uh, biopsies he's done of Morgellons lesions. Uh, and also Dr. Um, just Shah of Igenex Laboratories has seen some Bartonella, although primarily she has seen um, Borrelia spirochetes in the, um, in the lesions that she has looked at. But I, I, Constantly want to look more into the whole Bartonella connection here uh, because of what I've seen clinically. And this may be why I'm a little reluctant to jump right on the Lyme disease bandwagon, even though I'm the first person who 
who put out there that there was a connection between Lyme and Morgellons, but I still don't think I, I, it's hard for me to say Lyme causes Morgellons. You know, I just think there may be people with Morgellons happen to have Lyme. I, I don't know how it's all going to pan out. There's so much we still need to look into, but the Bartonella connection is very intriguing to me. Um, mostly because like I said, that's the treatment that helps people the most. So you mentioned several pharmaceutical type options. Are there any herbal options that can be helpful? Are there light therapies that people find that help with Mm -hmm. the skin lesions themselves? What about more in that integrative alternative realm? Are there solutions or things that are supportive for Morgellons? I am. Yes, I do. I have with um, Susan McCammy of Beyond Balance and I put together a protocol, an herbal protocol for people who are not willing to take antibiotics or cannot take antibiotics for whatever reason. So we do have that protocol available. And um, um, I'm not sure how to do this, Scott. I guess I can give People, I think you mentioned it. In, I think you mentioned it. I mean, you're welcome to give that out, but I think you mentioned that in the book as well, right? It's in the it's in the book too. Yep. Um, another product, again, I guess it's okay for me to mention name brands sure. in this. In this, sure. okay. Absolutely. All right. Uh, the other thing that I often uh, use is a product called BLT Microbial Balancer by Research Nutritionals. Um, that product is very good at targeting uh, Bartonella and and Lyme, and so I have found it to be very helpful too. And unfortunately, there are very many patients who are not able to take any of the Bartonella antibiotic uh, protocols because they get uh, tendon problems when they take quinolones, they're allergic to sulfa, and um, their stomach can't handle rifampin or something like that. So, so there are a fair amount of people where we do have to go to herbal treatment for Bartonella uh, just because, you know, the difficulty of tolerating any of the antibiotic options. Um, so, but I do feel that in, with my patients, I definitely use a very integrative approach to this whole thing because the way I explain it to my patients is we need to investigate and we need to look for every possible factor that's burdening your immune system and try to remove those because the more, the stronger your immune system gets, the better you're going to be able to to deal with this. So in some cases, that means mold exposure, removing people from the mold exposure, detoxing that. For some people, it's uh, detoxing metals. For some people, they end up having, you know, um, various intestinal parasites that need to be dealt with. I mean, the, the whole spectrum of things that could be occult in the body, you know, sinus infections. That's a very typical thing that people can have and not even realize it. Uh, These chronic uh, debilitating sinus infections. And so we look for those and treat those. So the whole approach is, is doing everything we can to, because we do not know the exact organism we're targeting and we don't know the exact treatment, really what's much more important than what we give in terms of an anti-infective agent is what we do to remove burdens from the immune system. And so, and you know, and this is the approach pretty much that all of us in in the tick-borne disease world are trying to do now when it comes to helping people get over their tick-borne infections. Absolutely. And uh, so it's the same story here. It's got really very, very similar situation. Just you know, look for everything that, that could possibly be, be getting in the way of, of a person healing. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, but what is the prognosis for someone that struggles with Morgellons? How long do, do they normally get treated before they're kind of at the end of their treatment course? Sounds like many or most of them do improve and get their life back, but any comments mm-hmm. that you can share on the general course or prognosis? Well, I would say that, first of all, if anybody listening to this has Morgellons, there is quite a lot of hope. And many people, most people get better. I will go so far as to say everyone gets better. You know, it's just a matter of how much better mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and how long it takes to get there. Um, you know, it, it can take a long time. And, and very much as it is with people with severe uh, tick-borne diseases, it takes 
longer than any of us would like. I've had patients that I've finally released from care after five or six years of treatment, and they're good to go. They're they're great, but whew, that was five or six years of treatment, you know. But but hey, they got there, so they're they're happy about that. But the hard part too, and this is very much like it is with treating Lyme patients, is people do get worse before they get better. And that is very hard for people to deal with because in the case of a Morgellons patient, what this means is even the crawling, stinging, biting, filaments, all that, that increases as well. So when you start to treat them, those sensations become almost unbearable. And there are patients who just say, I can't do it. I cannot deal with it. And, and, they, and they just abandon treatment. And, you know, it's very hard to get them to stick with it, knowing that, yes, it's bad now, but if we can get you over the hump, then then it's going to get better. And this is why you know I've I've, I've developed a, a support group for my patients because I think well I think this is true with tick-borne diseases, but in Morgellons it's probably even more necessary to have that um, you know have people you can talk to who totally understand what you're going through. I mean that is so important, and I like to hook my patients up. Uh, with uh, other patients who are maybe a couple steps ahead of them, kind of become their Morgellons buddy. And that person can give them a lot of reassurance and encouragement, like just hang in there. I went through that too. You, you know, you're going to get better. And I think that is all such an important part of treatment as well. So this next question is a little bit of a difficult one, but I know in the realm of Lyme disease, um, suicide is sometimes the end result of people that are experiencing Lyme. They, they just don't see that there is hope and they can't um, hold on to that idea or possibility. And so right. I'm wondering, with people struggling from Morgellons, is that also something that um, occurs in that community of people? I, I think, Scott, that probably it occurs more often in, in the Morgellons community. Um, it, it is a terrifying illness to have. Uh, the symptoms are terrifying. And then to have people around you, even those that you love and people close to you, telling you that you're delusional, I mean, <laughs> wow. It, it, I actually am surprised how... Few people do commit suicide considering what they're going through, and thank God for that. But they, uh, this is a big problem, and I've had it happen uh, with, with quite a few patients. I think, too, with a lot of my patients who appear to have committed suicide, I'm not positive whether it was unintentional because uh, the, the discomfort that they feel, the anxiety they feel from this, they're constantly in search of ways to feel calmer so they can accept what's going on with them. And many times they accidentally take too many sedating medications just in search of sleep or relaxation or lack of pain. And then that can happen too. So, you know, it's, it's just an, an, an awful situation, and these people are, are desperately, desperately wanting to be heard and listened to and taken care of. I, I find the situation is, is way worse than I ever saw in the world of, of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. It, it's, it's really a travesty what's going on, and the way patients are being treated by doctors is just... Uh, it's, it's, it's horrible. When I hear the stories, I, I, I can't e even believe it, that there are healthcare providers who would treat patients. Yeah. Like and I think that's, I think coming hopefully out of this discussion, one of the things that people get out of it is that there are people who believe the condition is real, that have tools that can help uh, improve the condition, improve the symptoms, get people their lives back. So I think you um, provide people with a lot of hope. And I think that's an important thing for people. I almost didn't even want to ask the question. But at the same time, I know that it's a reality of people dealing with the condition. Um, and so I hope what people take away from this is that there are lots of tools and solutions. And even though we may not have all of the answers, that um, there is a lot of hope um, for people with more challenges. Exactly, jealous. exactly. And that's what I tell people right off at their first appointment, you know, say, we're going to, you know, we're, you're going to get better. <laughs> that people will get better. And the people you read about on the internet that are not getting better and they're under treatment, something's missing. 
Mm-hmm. They're, yeah. they're, they're not, there is something that has not been identified that's playing an important part of it. But that's what I hate because my patients will get on, on the internet, read all of these really negative things by people saying, you're never going to get better. I haven't gotten better in 10 years, blah, 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 all these things like that. But I try to tell my patients, don't listen to that because you don't know that person's full story. You have no idea what's really going on there. Right. And so just try to listen to, to the hopeful messages. And uh, having treated so many people, I can tell you that the majority um, do have a, there is a reason to be hopeful. You know, there really is. And it's not easy. It's, it's, this, this disease isn't for sissies, you know, um, but you're, you, can, you can get better. And and I just I just want people to to know that that and and you may not be able to find somebody in your neighborhood, even in your state, who will treat this. But there are some of us out here. Um, there are too few of us, obviously. Um, but but just try. And the other thing that I am always more than happy to do is if you have a doctor who's at least sympathetic. Who, who says, you know, I really believe you've got something, but I have no idea what to do. Have them email me. I'm more than happy to guide them through this. There's no charge for that or anything. I just, I will help them to help you because I obviously can't, I just can't take care of all the people that there are out there. But I'm having more and more people, more and more healthcare providers are contacting me. And this really makes me feel good because it makes me realize that more of them are starting to realize, hey, wait, we're, we're dealing with something really real here. And so, you know, that, that's an encouraging yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to us a little about the Morgellons documentary, Skin Deep, The Battle Over Morgellons. Do we know when it's going to be released? I think that's going to be a really uh, helpful I, thing for I awareness wish I as well. Did. It's been a huge project. It's taken a lot of time and a lot of money. And again, just a uh, through the uh, pie where the person who is is doing this is, I mean, it's all basically through uh, his own donated time and finances. And so he's finally gotten all of the filming done, but now the editing is, is a huge project. And of course he has to work and make a living too. So I, I just don't know how long it's going to take to get it all uh, put together. Um, it would I mean, it's very much like when we had the movie coming out for for Lyme disease. I I think that that can reach a lot of people. That would be such, such a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, totally uh, agree. But you have to be empathetic to all of the people, the researchers, the people who are, you know, people like me writing the book, people like him putting in the film. We do this in our own, you know, quote unquote, spare time, you know, and, um, and, uh, so it's you know it's 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 very difficult uh, we you, there's no money behind getting the word out there on this or getting the research done for this so what are some other resources if people want to learn more about more gelins what are some tools that they can reach out and get more informed about it and then tell us a little bit more about the book as well i know people can get it on amazon.com but any other comments or resources you want to share well, I think um, some of your uh, best information uh, would always be to go to, and you can just Google the Charles E. Holman Foundation for Morgellons Research, and they keep a lot of things on their website there, various updated research information, just, just a lot, it, it, a lot can be found there. Right now, as far as in, in writing, the most um uh, hating to toot my own horn here, but <laughs> the most up-to-date, you know, bit of information you're going to get is going to be right here. And that it also is not at all sensational. You know, it's just based on what we know so far with, with research. You're going to find a lot of material out there on the internet, but believe me, uh, uh, m- most of it is sensational and not based on any uh, research or long time clinical experience. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to find a good information, but you would be, a, the name of my book is Morgellons, the legitimization of a disease. And I think if you go to Amazon and you just put in Morgellons, I think that's the first uh, thing that's going to pop up right now. 
Right. And uh, so also, if any of you out, out there um, or doctors want to order 10 copies of this or whatever, just send me an email and I can get you 10 copies or more at a much, much lower price. You know, like just say, for example, if you wanted to be able to hand them out to people or sell them in your waiting room or whatever, I can. I and can they can, I, I think your contact information is on your website, gingersavely.com, which I'll put in the show notes as right. well. You're welcome. If you want to mention an email address, that's fine. If you want to refer people just to the website, that's fine it's as well. It's always good to, to contact me through Lyme DC. So Lyme, like the disease, L-Y-M-E, and then DC stands for District of Columbia, where my office is at gmail.com. So linedc at gmail.com. So what are some of the key things that Ginger Savely does on a daily basis in support of your own health? Ah, uh (laughs) aha. Probably not as much as I, I'm like a typical (laughs) healthcare provider. (laughs) I I abused myself too much, but uh, you know, I am feel I am very lucky, and I think you're you have the same kind of luck, Scott, is to be doing something professionally that I really love. So, like for example, when I was writing that book, to me, I mean, a lot of people were saying, "Oh my gosh, you're writing that book!" Oh, and I was like, to me, I was just it was the most fun thing in the world. <laughs> so, I was very excited about it, you know. And so, I think anytime you can be working on something that makes you feel good. Some people are lucky enough to have that thing be their profession, but other people are, um, uh, sorry about the, the, <laughs> the background there. Um, uh, some people are, are, have to look elsewhere for that, you know, like in their hobbies and that sort of thing. Right. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just realized that she's on camera now. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. She doesn't speak English. So, um, <laughs> so I um, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I want to thank you for all the work that you've done over so many years for people with Lyme and Morgellons, um, and especially for the work with Morgellons. I think so many people um, have turned their back on people that have a very real struggle, and you were there years and years ago when it was even less accepted than it is now. And so I think that speaks volumes about you as a person. And I just appreciate and honor you for being someone that people could count on. Oh, that's so nice of you to say, Scott. Of course, I feel all those same ways about you. <laughs> Both of us have been devoted uh, to uh, to trying to spread the word, basically. You know, trying to trying to help people with uh, a reassurance. I think is the number one uh, uh, thing that can help people when they are not doing well physically or emotionally. And uh, spreading information that will give people reassurance is. Uh, one of the most valuable things that can be done and and you know that's that's what you do so what you do is 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 priceless i mean thanks yeah. bless you for doing it <laughs> and, I, and i and i enjoy it too it's nice to do something that exactly. feels purposeful and that you can help other people so thanks so much I, I look forward to talking with you again really soon and hopefully seeing you at ilads in november oh yeah you know i'll be there <laughs> all right thanks <laughs> bye bye okay bye scott To learn more about today's guest, visit gingersavely.com. That's gingersavely, spelled S-A-V-E-L-Y, dot com. gingersavely.com. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.